Uh, welcome back. Welcome to session number five. And I know a lot of you are really, really looking forward to, to our uh, kaupapa kōrero today. So um, let's not waste any time and get straight into it. So, e toru ngā pūtake o tēnei karakia ko te whakamoe miti ko te pūmau me te tono. Ara he karakia paku o ki tēnei nā te hāhiringa tū. Ara ko mutsa ki ngā whakamārama i tēnei wā. E hōnore he kroria ki te atua te runga wa he mau ngā rongo ki runga i te whenua he whakaaro pai ki ngā tānga katoa āme. E te atua e tō mātau atua nei hoki mātau o pōna i rāro i wōmana i tanga i tēnei wā e te atua. E te atua e tō mātau atua te te tuku whakamoe mi te atua na mātau ki a koe i tēnei wā. Kia mana ki te a ie koe ngā pakeke, ngā kau mātua, ngā rangatahi, ngā taiohi o tira tainua atu ki ngā tamariki mokopuna. Ano e te atu mana ki te a ie koe ngā tāngata, i roto i ngā whare herehere, ngā whare wairangi, ngā whare hauara tainua atu ki ngā ohipera. Ano e te atu a arahi koe i a mātau, i runga i te huarahi tika, ara kia pai hoki tā mātau haere i roto i tēnei au huruhuri. Ano e te atua i tō mātau atua, tēnei rā te ingoa i atu ki a koe, kia mana ki tia i e koe, e ngā whānau e noho ana i raru i te kapua pauri i tēnei wā e te atua, o tira tai atu ki ngā whānau e noho mā wiwi ana. Ara me ngā whānau hoki e noho ana i ngā taumahatango tēnei au huruhuri i tēnei wā. E te atua he pono mā wō mātau mate e pīkau mā wano hoki o mātau pauri tanga katoa i waha. Ko koe anō te tae pitsui taki o ngā matiri nei te au katoa kroori a ki tō i ngā tapu. Āmene. Āra kia ora tātou. O tira e kore e mutu ngā mihi ki ngā mate huhua i ngā tōpito e whā o te motu. O tira ki ngā mate uru tānō te au whānui hoki i tēnei wā. Āra, once again, welcome back. Thank you for joining us today. Now that we have opened our kōrero, um, I'm going to hand over the, the talking stick, I guess. Um, te rākau, uh, kia kōtau e ngā ahorangi. Uh, kia ora wei tini, uh, tūtai mahi tēnei ki a koe kua whakatū whera tō tātou uh, hui, ki te ata nei, uh, tēnā koe. Um, <clears throat> so we're on kōrero five and uh, today we wanted to kind of move a little bit through uh, some of the decolonizing methodologies indigenous <coughs> projects from uh, from Linda's publication and then come through to talking a little bit about some um, ideas and grounding platforms for the future and um, <clears throat> in the second part in particular both Linda and Graham will engage more in a, a conversation around around those things and where we want to go to from here but I wanted to start really with chapter six in the uh, book, Decolonising Methodologies Around Indigenous, Indigenous People's Project. Um, <clears throat> and particularly around, Linda, you talk in there about social movements of Indigenous peoples and international mobilisation and that connectedness across uh, Indigenous nations as being particularly important. So I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about the significance of that um, for Māori and for Indigenous peoples more broadly around the connectedness of our social movements. Okay, well kia ora, kia ora everyone. Um, I guess the, the, the main point is to realise we're not alone as Māori and our story, while it has unique elements to it, is part of a much greater story. So we know a component of a story, but the story of colonization of indigenous peoples is a five, six hundred year old story. And uh, we are a small, actually a small chapter in that story that came rather late in the 17th, 18th century. And I think one of the reasons it's important for us to kind of realize that is, A, we're not alone. Um, and our struggle is not a singular struggle. That we have um, other peoples like us who went through the same um, experiences and um, have had to 
kind of work out how best to survive those experiences. But what's also important is how, um, I guess in the end, different Indigenous peoples found each other, especially after the Second World War, and used that moment of um, kind of the formal decolonization after World War II to kind of come together and really advance an international um, agenda. And, you know, now everyone here understands the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Well, that would not have happened without the leadership, activism, activism, um, advocacy of Indigenous leaders across the world who were able to come together, bring the different parts of the story into um, a larger narrative, if you like, and then focus strategically on the rights of Indigenous peoples. Now, that wasn't easy to do. Um, everyone wants to stand on their unique nationhood. And you see that even now as groups go for the kind of annual meeting of the Secretariat of Indigenous Peoples at the UN. We, we all think we're rather special, uh, but we need to understand that we can't be in those forums without the allies of other Indigenous peoples. And we are fighting across so many fronts, whether it's in the environment and traditional knowledge, diversity, uh, intellectual, cultural property, you name the domains, we, we simply don't have the capacity to be um, fighting international campaigns where the struggle is real in terms of its impact on us here in Aotearoa. So I do think the social movement part's important, the political part is important, the coalition, collaboration, international alliances. Um, we are also more allied to English speaking um, Indigenous peoples, but there are millions of Indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, you know, there are those in um, Central and South America who also have been hugely powerful um, in the international domain. And then there are groups who are still not allowed to call themselves Indigenous, who are trapped in countries that deny their indigeneity. So it is a major collaboration. I wanted to um, <clears throat> just pick up on some of the conversation you and Graham shared in the first two sessions around the 80s. And there were particular Indigenous people that we connected to uh, in terms of the language and uh, cultural revitalization movement. Um, and there were particular movements that uh, informed that. So what, what do you see as having been quite significant movements that informed that? And maybe some comment too, and Graham, you might want to jump in on this too, around, I remember in the 80s, you having a particularly strong relationship with Aboriginal educationalists like Bob Morgan and others. Mm. Uh, we haven't talked very much about that, but I think it was quite significant. So the kind of movements that had helped inform our revitalization movement, uh, and maybe some of those relationships that you deliberately and intentionally formed in the 80s. Yeah. I mean, I'd start back in the 70s because actually our political activist groups were well connected even then to um, the American Indian movement in the US, the Indian Brotherhood movement in Canada, and the Aboriginal activist movement in um, Australia. And so the tent embassy that we have here that we, you know, see Tamaiti has been a key creator of that um, action. Um, there was a tent embassy in Canberra prior that our uh, Aborigine brothers and sisters um, established. So there were international, I wouldn't say they were like big networks, but there were opportunities in which uh, people visited each other. We were inspired by what other groups did. Um, we paid attention to the civil rights movement, to the discourses. 
So that then was in place. And to be honest, some of those relationships are still there. Um, I still talk to, you know, someone like Gary Foley, who was uh, a real um, significant person in the Aborigine tent embassy. Everyone's getting old um, and not well. You know, so I just emailed him to, to say, um, this is the one time when I really think he should be locked up because uh, I know he's so unwell. Uh, so he sent me a cheeky response as well. And I know he keeps, you know, friends with Hone um, Harawira and others that there is this international cadre of people. And then that then feeds in, I think, to the 1980s and the beginning of a whole lot of networks. Um, so there's the networks formed by those who went to Geneva to begin the drafting of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I know my sister Aro Hamid was part of that, Moana Jackson, Naniko Manhinik, you know, there were those who were just going every year. They were mostly self-funded, uh, but out of that, you know, developed um, really what we have now as the, as the declaration. And then across education, health and others. So I'll invite Graham to share some of those networks. Yeah, I think in, in the early, early days where it was a smaller group of of uh, activists that were connected across different countries and uh, you know and some were quite edgy in the sense that they traveled to Libya and other places yeah. uh, and and oh, yeah. in a sense became uh, educated to uh, some of the structural politics that we uh, needed to engage with so these were about uh, disempowerment of indigenous peoples this was about uh, you know, moving beyond just the language cultural struggle to also understanding the politics of our existence in terms of our survival as Indigenous uh, people. So there's a, a particular connectedness around this in the 1970s uh, leading into the 1980s. In the 1980s, with the rise of Kohanga Reo and uh, it sort of became then a significant cultural struggle for us in New Zealand. And, um, and you know, on the backs of all of those early people who engaged in Kohanga and, uh, you know, uh, developed all of those, uh, that, that tremendous uh, transformative movement, that's something that uh, actually gave us leverage also to the rest of the world. The rest of the world were interested in what was happening here in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, a key element of that was why, had, you know, how did you get the buy-in of Māori communities to this significant, you know, resistant sort of struggle around transforming our language and rebuilding our revitalising language? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and that, and that was a, a, a key that people wanted to see because, you know, obviously, you know, we have a lot of our people who are too invested in the system and uh, and therefore uh, give up the, uh, or, or don't take the opportunity to struggle. And, um, and so, you know, th these are the questions that we were beginning to answer of, in terms of mobilising a significant collective of people who were about trying to transform the agenda. And uh, they were interested in that. Uh, which just moved beyond, uh, you know, uh, quite narrow political uh, uh, movements. Although I have to say that um, we also followed very closely, as Linda's indicated, you know, some of the issues that arose in not just the civil rights movement, but uh, AIM, the American Indian movement, and some of the big struggles that they had, which were very powerful and, you know, uh, you know really clarified the relationship between, uh, you know, the, uh, the the power politics of the state versus the small indigenous interest groups. Mm. So, a very important part of uh, understanding our development, and I think an informative part of, you know, again, learning from where we've been, looking at at uh, where we want to go in the future. <coughs> 
So in the development of the projects that you have under in, uh, decolonizing methodologies, you have the 25 indigenous projects and, and clearly they're informed by that, those movements and by yeah. those political transformative activist movements. Oh. So can you talk a little bit about the projects and how you kind of came about, I guess, the development of that idea of identifying 25 indigenous projects? Yeah. Um, I, I see it as, so I was traveling a lot, um, you know, um, what some people may not realize I was partly educated in the US in the late 1960s, went to secondary school there, had a, yeah, where I was mistaken for an American Indian. Um, they were so, you know, ignorant really even in the state of Illinois, Illinois, which is an indigenous name. Um, but certainly my awareness was peaked and then I came home um, to New Zealand and uh, was involved in our Tamatoa. And those, so I started to think about these issues and then as I traveled, I encountered the same story. When we met indigenous groups, they would all say the same thing. We are the most researched people in the world. Um, you know, those researchers have come, they've taken, you know, and they've left and they've never come back and we've seen no benefits. And so that was a message that really, I still hear it when I travel, resonated across every Indigenous context I went to. But I chose also to look at what Indigenous peoples were actually doing because they weren't lying around on the couch saying, oh, we're the most indigenous, you know, research people in the world. They were actually putting their energy into a range of activities, and that's what intrigued me. So despite what everyone has said about colonisation, what were our people doing? And they were doing amazing things. When you put it into a more proactive um, kind of lens on it, you could begin to see all the work that um, Indigenous peoples were doing to argue for their rights, to reclaim, to be persistent about claiming not just their lands, but their tonga back from museums. Uh, so, and it, it really that was what the projects were generated from, this um, flax roots, grassroots, activity and energy that you could see indigenous peoples investing. Now remember at the same time you had all these dominant discourses saying indigenous people don't care, they don't care about their children, they don't care about um, their language, they're violent, they abuse their children, you know, so there was this huge discourse saying all these negative things about indigenous peoples. But at the same time, you could see, well, actually, they, they're caring in particular ways. They're caring um, about their children, but in order to address the issues confronting them, they're having to address these issues around land, around sovereignty, um, around language and identity. So, And they were simply coming at it from the spaces that meant the most to them, and also where they had resources and that were positive energy producing kind of projects. So to me, the 25 uh, projects were um, a way to kind of capture that positivity that was going on underneath this kind of dominant negative discourse about Indigenous peoples. So the projects I wanted to show were actually Indigenous peoples are doing a lot of research, a lot of knowledge seeking, um, a lot of productive work, a lot of mobilising and here's some of the areas. Here's 25 areas in which you can see it at work. You know, and that's, that was very different from, so if you go to the literature at that time, even now in some areas, and you and you ask the literature, um, you know, what are indigenous people doing? It would say things like, oh, they're dying. 
you know, that's what they're doing. Oh, they're hopeless. Oh, you know, they're, they are not looking after themselves. So it was so negative. And in that sense, the literature either was supremely negative or it completely erased us anyway and ignored what we were doing. And so this was really a counter to that. Yeah, I, I think it's multiple sort of sites of struggle. Mm. A, again, so, you know, and I think there's, there's a, um, if you like, a, a, a subtle critique here, which uh, I want to try and pick up at the end, which is that I think that we're in danger of being too narrowly focused on our language, knowledge and culture. It's absolutely important. I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't do that, but on its own, it's not going to deliver the sort of change in the future that I think that we, uh, that we need to be uh, working towards. So, you know, the idea of those 25 projects, and I know there's more out there, are just different sites of where the struggle is occurring and, and taking on, if you like, the uh, systemic elements of oppression, of exploitation, of colonization in, in uh, different ways. So just pick up on, um, there are more out there. Uh, we're aware that um, you're doing the third version of the, of the book, and uh, part of that is including a whole new range of new uh, yeah. projects uh, that have become more evident in the past few years in particular. Um, <clears throat> so there are a couple that I, that I looked at uh, from the work that you sent me um, that I thought would be really good for you maybe to comment on. Uh, one is retracing pathways yes. in terms of healing. The other was refreshing indigenous collectives, and that's picking up again about the mobilization and the international connectedness. Mm -hmm. And the last one, uh, instructions for the future, we're going to come back to because that's um, yeah. <clears throat> our kind of closing conversation, but particularly those two. The retracing pathways for healing from trauma and refreshing indigenous collectives. Can you talk a little bit about those? Well, and I have to acknowledge here the work of the, you know, Karina Walters and Michelle Johnson Jennings and that group who've been kind of um, re-walking the Trail of Tears as part of their Choctaw, a Choctaw Health and Wellbeing Project. And, you know, I've listened to them talk about this and it's helped me kind of understand in a sense why we do have to retrace those painful stories. Not because we're, um, we want to be re-traumatized so much, but to be healed, we've kind of got to go there and not avoid it. And we do have to confront it. And I think these retracing the pathways if you begin to look at some of our healing journeys, that's very much um, what a number of indigenous communities are doing. Because you have to say, what are we trying to heal from? One of the things we're not talking about um, is no use just putting a bandage or you know, a band-aid and saying this, this is going to heal us. We do have to go to places and I think uh, what the Yapali project taught me in, in listening over maybe three or four years as they've um, talked about their project is out of it, they learned to, they learned the power of their ancestors. I think they learned um, and have come to honour the legacies and the gifts their ancestors taught them as they walked along this really awful, terrible journey. Um, and they've come to honour their ancestors in very kind of deep, powerful ways. And I think they've been able to connect that story then to the story of health and well-being now. Um, and so I see some of our, you know, health journeys and around trauma, intergenerational trauma, some of the things happening in, um, around, you know, domestic violence even, that these are sourced way back in time. And 
it is trying to figure out ways, and I think our providers, our hauora providers, kind of work with this intuitively, is how do you retrace these pathways in a safe way, in a healing way? And how do you come out the end of it with um, a sense that that's been a healing journey? So I think it's kind of a, quite a powerful project. Um, and in it, I would sort of recognise the canoe journeys that are occurring on the left northwest coast of the US. I know there's um, other kind of trips that here at home, like uh, recently a group from Ngāti Pro uh, walked up the Raukumara and they came over the top into Te Whānau Apunui. It was a journey. They were reconstructing ancient pathways that used to connect the two iwi, but that too was this healing journey because by walking through the Rokumara ranges and by becoming familiar again with all the plants and the birds there and the creeks and the waterways, you know, that in itself was really empowering. So that was that one. Um, what was the second one? The Refreshing Indigenous Collectives. Yeah, well, hmm. I mean, I think we're experiencing some of that here in Aotearoa, that, you know, good initiatives really, or well, any development has a kind of 20, 30 year lifespan. Um, and that's seen as equivalent to a generation. But um, all our developments evolve, change, and so does the context in which they exist. And I guess the standout for us has been, in New Zealand, has been the Kohanga Reo and the National Trust and some of the issues that they've gone through in terms of governance. But I think as a practice, it's good that every generation has the opportunity to renew um, their commitment to those particular uh, ways of organising and the institutions we've built in order for them to be sustainable, but also in order for them to actually meet the dreams and aspirations and visions under which they were established. I think if we don't review ourselves, if we don't refresh what we're on about, then we're in danger of kind of wrapping these initiatives in a sort of concrete box that in the end will be the death of them, quite literally, because they become smaller and smaller, more confined. Um, they become very defensive, very territorial, um, mean to others, start to exclude people, and start to exclude way more people than they actually include. Those are always danger signs um, to me of an entity not thriving. So the moment an entity starts attacking others, being defensive, not open to scrutiny, um, and got more rules for why they shouldn't do things than ideas about how they can do things, that's usually a danger signal in terms of the sustainability. And, you know, if we think about sustainability, a marae is a good example of an institution that's deeply Māori in the way it's developed in Aotearoa. It has been sustained as an institution for hundreds of years. But it's not the same institution now that it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, or 300 years ago, or 1,000 years ago. It's changed but it still stands. And I'll just add that, uh, you know, again, just picking, keeping the thesis that I'm sort of developing here is that, you know, the, the, uh, the narrowing down of the, the power, the transformative power mm. of kohanga, for example, it's not just something that we're doing uh, on our own. You know, often it's been driven by uh, the systemic uh, uh, context in which we're mm. trying to exist of competitiveness for meager amount of of funding of you know someone controlling the policy agenda etc etc and so you know my thing is that we uh, again need to be uh 
I think, cognizant of the whole idea of domestication, that uh, the, the movement itself is being domesticated by the system. In other words, incorporated into the system, made to look like the system, so that it's not uh, seen as some sort of uh, um, negative uh, critical agency on the outside of the mainstream. Uh, so we have to, you know, again, conscientize ourselves to those sorts of politics. And, and I agree with Linda, it, renewal is an important part of how we need to think about going forward with some of these movements. How do we renew them and get them up again for the new context in which we're trying to exist? So it's probably a good time to move into um, the question around future development. <clears throat> and we, we were going to um, ideas around where we may go to from here. There's been an increased kind of discussion around this idea of indigenous futurities, um, thinking way into the future. Mm. And one of your projects, Linda, uh, in this uh, new version <clears throat> is called Instructions for Generations into the Far Future. Mm. So can you talk a little bit about that? And then Graham, if you could then follow on with the discussion around platforms for future development. Mm. Yeah, so I think um, really what I've been thinking about in, in terms of the future is understanding the legacies that we were left um, and the fact that those powerful uh, visions and instructions that our generation have been inspired by um, and have helped us be who we are and have inspired us to act in ways that uh, have taken us out of maybe those things that are comfortable, you know, that that's a really powerful legacy. But the question is, what are we leaving? Uh, what's our contribution to the next generations for the future that we can, we can see? There's many of the things that are happening now. We can see the long-term implications and my question is, what then are the um, inspiring messages that we consciously want to uh, provide for future generations? And I think there's a couple of hopeful uh, messages in that. Uh, number one is we can see a future. And we can see a future in which being Māori is really it's still going to be there. And these key ideas we've inherited and have struggled for are going to be carried forward into the future. I think that's really important because to not see a future is to, what, give up, is to give up hope um, and just kind of live for the moment. And so the, to me, I'm kind of playing with the word futurity. I'm not sure yet what it how i really feel about it which is why i've used a, an alternative term the far far future um and thinking about it multiple generations like not not just three four generations but um you know five hundred thousand years really thinking through what it means but seeing that in a hopeful way not as a what's called a dystopian, um, ap apocalyptic way, but that it's hopeful. And we should take hope from what we've learned thus far. Um, but we do have a responsibility to make a contribution in the same way that our tipuna have for us. That's how I kind of see it. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think, I, you know, I start from where we were when we began the, um, you know, with Kohanga and Kura and, you know, the, the dream then was that we wanted to produce you know, young Māori kids who had all of their cultural elements intact, could participate fully as Māori citizens in the Māori world because 
Māori still want to be Māori, Māori still needed to be Māori, our institutions like Tangihanga and so on were still important, that we needed to participate. So that's one element. It's the cultural domain. The other part of it was that we wanted our kids to also have the whole world you know, uh, as an opportunity to participate in and have the choices that were of today uh, that they could be uh, make uh, in ways which did not compromise their maori if you like. And uh, I have to say, what has been heartwarming for me is seeing a lot of our kura kids around, you know, whether they're bankers or whether they're <laughs> doctors and lawyers and or whether they're, they're, they're mamas, you know, just at home with kids and so on. They are all successful in the sense that they've got this maori element that's really powerful on the, on the side, but they've also got, you know, all of these other opportunities. And, um, you know, I know in Canada they talked about Citizen Plus, about this being an, an, an opportunity for, for uh, you know, Indigenous people wanted to be Citizens Plus. And it was sort of uh, uh, the, the book that was written about that was very negative and derogatory, actually. Uh, but, uh, but that's in my head, is that's what I think is, is uh, still uh, the potential that's under-realised at the moment. And I think it's under-realised because I, I feel that uh, we've only, we're only participating in half of the struggle. We've done, you've got lots of wonderful people now in the language knowledge struggle, but we aren't doing the other half of it in providing, if you like, the, the full round of opportunities that might be available to our young, uh, young people coming forward. The kudas are... But as you know, a lot of our, our, our uh, young ones are not uh, coming through Kura. They're spread right across the system. So, and then the question becomes, am I wanting to, I see it, I'm using these words in inverted commas, waste my time trying to change the system, or do I want to just invest in building our own alternatives to, if you like, uh, develop a manifest critique, a visible critique of the system and hopefully the, the transformation occurs that way. I think bottom line for me is that unrealised potential uh, that we need to build the other side of the struggle, which is the conscientisation of our people in the language struggle. We, our language will not survive just on our language struggle, in my view. I think that if we don't deal with colonisation, if we don't deal with all of those forces that are wanting to mainstream us, to assimilate us, which continue, because, you know, as I say, colonisation hasn't gone away, then if we don't deal with that adequately, then I think that we're on a short-term sort of uh, 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 limited sort of time with our, our language and culture that it's going to get eroded over time. And I always remember, you know, the saying about uh, even, you know, the, the critique in the early days. In fact, I think it was Hone Ka, who was actually a minister, who said, our people spend too much time looking up, holding our hands in supplication to God, while the land has been ripped from under their feet. And, you know, so, you know, I think those things, uh, we need to get a good balance in, in, in what we're thinking about. So our future, I think, is predicated first on that sort of notion. And then I think the world's our oyster about how far we can go in each of these uh, different pathways. And we've got some really tremendous examples, as I said, um, uh, of uh, very successful uh, kura uh, 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 graduates who are uh, leading the way. Just um, one other thing from it that you always said uh, was a need to celebrate all of the little, you know, all of the little incremental all the trees, right? Yeah, incremental. And, and, and alongside that, you would say um, you would always advocate this for this kind of Habermasian utopian vision. Yeah. Well, still done at the time. So yeah. with both of those things. And this is a big question for both of you. For future generations, is Tilavanga Tiratanga still 
the utopian vision? Is it still the vision we're driving to? And what are your ideas for the future around how this generation can continue to contribute to that? Oh, well, I'll go uh, first, and then <laughs> because I'm a, it, it just connects with what I've said. So um, the answer is yes. And uh, the, the context of that, the model was that, um, you know, uh, was actually uh, was a critique of focusing just on the utopian vision, on the outcome, on tinoranga tinotanga as the goal. And uh, the reason that we wanted to just temper that that struggle towards and just keep naming tinoranga tinotanga as the uh, outcome was because uh, what we learned from looking at other international movements like civil rights and, and uh, the early feminist movements in the United States in the 1960s, 70s, was that people, those move, movements fell off, they lost their momentum because people kept asking, well, when do we get civil rights? When do we arrive? When do we get there? When do we have uh, gender equality, etc.? When do we get there? And so people fell off those movements. And um, what I, what I uh, read into, you know, uh, Habermas's reconstruction of the, uh, of, uh, the, the utopian uh, uh, project, but uh, more, uh, uh, more fundamentally, the, the reinsertion of uh, critical theory in the 1970s, uh, was the, the idea that... He kept saying, we're looking in the wrong place if we are continue, continually asking, when will we arrive at the utopian vision? When will we get tinoranga tiratanga? And what he says really is that we may never ever get there in our lifetime, but we need to celebrate the small incremental victories along the way to our utopian goal. And um, what, what he's saying here is that our struggle for tinoranga tiratanga is important in, to name because it gives impetus and direction to our struggle. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's a really important motivating thing as we think about that. And, and I think, uh, I think it's, it's right to keep naming tinoranga tiratanga as the utopian vision. Um, and because what is that about? That's about our own autonomy. It's about us. Uh, being able to have more control over the meaningful elements that impact our lives. And I think that's important. That's, that's where we need to go. That's where uh, you know, our future has to lie, uh, when we can make decisions for ourselves that are going to have impact. I see it a little bit differently from Habermas. <laughs> Um, you say Mrs. Habermas. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so the way I look at it is yeah. not to imagine Manamotu Hake or Tinoranga Tiratanga as the end goal, but to imagine beyond that, how how will we be, how will we live through the generations of already having Manamotu Hake. All right, so it's not about getting to a point where we have um, this, which I guess is what Habermas is saying, don't worry about that um, so much. Whereas I think what we should be looking through is, okay, so what do you do when you get it? What kind of people are we going to be? Are we just going to be, um, you know, right-wing, um, not very nice human beings? We're going to be um, capitalists? we're going to participate in the sort of neoliberal global project, or we're going to be a different kind of people altogether because we're practicing being um, and having rangatiratanga and having mana motuhake. And one of the things that gives me hope about that, I don't see that as being far and distant. I look at what our people do every day now, the everyday acts, of manamotuhake, the everyday acts of sovereignty that our people still practice. And it gives me huge hope and heart that we keep practicing 
it starts to embed this reality, the social reality about being um, being a people who know what it means to have rangatira tanga, to have mana motuhake. And it's a people who can think broadly and widely and openly and creatively and imaginatively and technologically uh, and mathematically that we can think in these ways, that we are inventive, but they were also kind and we are collaborative and we care about um, others and we're not just little iwi entities looking at our own pit door and saying how fabulous we are, um, but we're a people who are big hearted and who can function in the world in, by practicing the values we've been taught are important to us. So I'm not sure if that actually goes with Habermas or not, but yeah. I think it's a... Thank you for talking about way. incremental yeah. victories. Yeah. yeah, there are incremental victories, but, <laughs> but it's seen beyond the aspiration of rangatira tanga, and it's practicing the yep. being of it now and embedding that in the next generation and the next generation because that's the seed. But embedding it in a, in a, in a big, hearted, value-laden way. That's how I think about it. <laughs> you know, during this time of um, Ahui around COVID-19 and we've, you've talked in other sessions about the kinds of things that we are already doing, yeah. They actually are exampling that, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> they give us examples of living rangatira tanga, living being autonomous and self-determining. Um, <clears throat> and I don't want to put a damper on that. But on the other hand, <laughs> we also have this, we have amazing work being done, I'll say that first, by uh, the Prime Minister and particularly the Director General of Health. So Ashley Burnfield <laughs> and uh, Jacinda Adin. And every day they come on at one o'clock and they give an update. But noticeably, when they speak about Māori, we are still just another sector, another kind of another part of society. We actually aren't spoken about in a way that is about Rangatiratā. So when asked about Māori business, the response was, well, we're going across all the sectors and all the industries we're talking to, and that will include talking to iwi. So we're just another sector, we're not actually a treaty partner in that conversation. Um, <clears throat> talking about what do Māori need to do in terms of being well in this context of the virus, one of the responses was, well, what everyone else is doing. Mm. But we know that's not enough for Māori <clears throat> and for Indigenous people in this. We have to do that plus more. Um, so in terms of how do we then continue to be asserting Rangatiratanga as whānau hapala iwi in the way that we have been uh, and how do we push it to the next level for some kind of transformative change to come, particularly in health. Because under you were on the tribunal around health um, and we know all of those issues will remain when we come out of COVID-19. So how do we take it up a, a notch? Well, I think um, one of the things we can take heart at is Māori have not been passive and silent in this process. Um, so I, I do know that, you know, the iwi leaders in particular, but also the um, Māori pandemic response group, was it Whaka Kaupapa, Urita, um, that group, and a lot of more regional, multi-iwi-based uh, collaborations on the ground have been doing enormous work to um, mobilise really what Māori need to do. Um, I'm part of a number of conversations across education, health and business where they've all noticed the same thing, that we all understand the need for clarity of message that our Prime Minister is giving, but we also know that that message is not nuance to Māori and that we've needed other mechanisms in order to translate and reframe some of that messaging so it makes sense for Māori. You know, two, two good examples was when they said 
you know, the most vulnerable population are those over 70. Well, and it became really clear in the Māori health space, well, actually, for Māori, that's probably over 50 um, are the most vulnerable population because of the completely different health uh, profile of Māori. So a very quick reframing um, of that key message. Um, the thing about, you know, social distancing, well, it's not about social distancing. It's about physical distancing and about social um, connectivity. I think if you remove from the scene now what Māori organisations and iwi are doing, that's the grim reality of um, disparity and inequity would show through even more. Um, the fact that iwi have organised and mobilised and a lot of Māori provider groups have kind of come together to provide care packages, kai um, connectivity to our whānau has been really super important. You, you know, you're right about that sort of default in a crisis. So when a crisis occurs, it's like the treaty goes out the door. There's no treaty. And I, I'm participating in another conversation about business. You know, they're talking about getting business up and running. And so there are these business meetings happening across the country. No Māori in them. No Māori organisations. No Māori leaders. No Māori businesses are, are allowed to participate. So I think, you know, this situation that we're in right now just, tell, just demonstrates why the treaty is so important to the way decisions need to be made in this country. Otherwise, the time lag between the message and what we can do on the line, do ourselves, is too great. Because while we are trying to get to the table, the people at the table are at the front of the queue to get government funding. And that's my political speech for the day. <laughs> All right, so as an oppressed person in the household, <laughs> I'll offer a couple of comments here. The, the, um, I want to say that actually uh, what the crisis has shown is really our kaupapa Māori principles of whakawhanaungatanga, you know, that, that uh, socio-economic mediation that's embedded in our cultural ways and knowledge and, uh, and uh, the fact that... Uh, you know, it was, we're uh, leaning on that, we're mobilising around that. It's a lesson that we need to learn, you know, going forward, that, that in our cultural ways and practices, we have some of the answers. Some of the answers reside within our cultural ways and, and being. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we get uh, some confidence, uh, recognition of our iwi infrastructure that's been... Uh, you know, managing some of the stuff and some of the other groups that have come together to uh, assist that. But as individuals, that individual conscience first, I think is where I'm hoping that people will grasp that as a learning uh, point. You know, then moving to understanding our, you know, the need for a social collective um, uh, um, uh, means of engagement, of practice. So, you know, beginning with ourselves and getting the understanding here of how that moves and then working collectively. So in our collective um, practice, we've got some of the answers that I think, you know, I'm hoping that we can learn beyond this. Well, I know um, <clears throat> yesterday, Tracy Hopapa and Thoma um, did a piece on, on um, the news around you know, their willingness to come to the fore. And I think those some other organisations like FOMA, um, <clears throat> but also the iwi organisations have the thrill of potential, I think, to step in to that space yeah. uh, and to create our own conversations. I think that will go beyond. One of the things that's been really evident is the increased use of Te Māori on mainstream TV mm -hmm. in the past um, three or four weeks. Um, <clears throat> and the way in which people introduce themselves using to the Māori and all of the stand-ups that they have. And so, you know, 
that aspiration for it to go deeper than just a kind of superficial tēnā koutou katoa and then move into, you know, the mainstream mm. dominant way of thinking. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I wanted just to give you both an opportunity to make comment around, I guess, how you see, and we've had a little bit of conversation around this earlier, but uh, what you think are critical things we need to do as Māori now, as we move into a shift probably into a level three, but a, definitely a post-COVID-19 space, uh, which is, um, you know, being promoted by some as being a different normal. Is it really going to be a different normal for us? And how do we make it a different normal? Good question. Um, I, I guess I'm a little bit more cautious than some about thinking that the world is going to be changed because I, I do think that um, a lot of the structures like capitalism and that are being, they're going to remain because they've been shored up and supported by governments and corporations. So it might change a little bit. I think those basic structural things will be in place. But a couple of things that um, I know we've talked about here in Whanganui is it's that we can take heart from. Um, one is the issues around sustainability and moving um, into the future for Māori. So to be honest, in the post-settlement um, era, what have been created are a lot of Māori entities that are very um, well-defined, legislatively uh, mandated, if you like, but they're, they're all operating as silos. And so what's been forced to occur here, and I think across all regions, is this actual greater collaboration across our own entities, hapu, and iwi. And I think that's an important wake-up call that actually no single iwi, no single provider, no single hapu can provide the depth and breadth of services that are needed in this crisis. And um, so, you know, the word we've had from Cheryl um, Smith and others is that coming together in our own spaces is really important strengthening and enhancing those are, are going to be very powerful to move forward because we've spent a lot of time now, um, you know, 25 years trying to be stand up autonomous little nations with, um, you know, some barely supportive um, other structures alongside. But, but and Iwi is not an island either in the sense of we exist because Iwi have relationships. Iwi have whakapapa connections. Iwi are connected by awa and maunga and whenua. And we need to strengthen and enhance those. So I guess what I'm saying is out of, out of this uh, pandemic, the first things we need to do is um, understand the strength of our value system as a resiliency mechanism, but also enhance the wider capacity of our people. Because I think that's a good building block then to think about some of the innovations, um, some of the ways we can be more economically uh, resilient and independent. I'm I'm going to suggest that our intergenerational thinking uh, should have made uh, some of our businesses maybe a bit more resilient over time. But I also know a number of iwi investment arms would have taken a big hit economically in this pandemic because they've been investing in the same sorts of um, capital markets that Pakas have invested in. They've been investing in it for money, to make money and profit, rather than really building the long-term sustainability um, of people. And that should be a wake-up call also to the way 
um, our investment arms are investing in the future. So I'll hand it over to Graham before I wrap it on a bit more. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, uh, um, you know, I think one of the big things is that um, iwi need to uh, reflect carefully on what's happened uh, in this COVID crisis. And because I think um, we, you know, as we've uh, identified, you know, more generally, we can't keep doing the same old things that aren't working. And I think that uh, resilience uh, for iwi needs to be thought about and we need to prepare in different ways for that, which is, and some of the examples have just emerged, if you like, from our community practice. And, it's, and I think the formative lessons for some of the big picture stuff around, um, you know, our economic investment. You know, a lot of our iwi have split the, the um, investment arm of the iwi into a separate structure, which is about profit and building, you know, around uh, a very similar infrastructure that you might see in the corporate world. And then the social arm, um, if you like, is, re resides with the runanga and others. And, and these two groups are often contesting. I think that what this uh, issue has shown us is that there needs to be a closer collaboration if we're able to we need to be able to, um, you know, uh, access, I think, the uh, more, uh, I think, unified sort of response at the iwi level to issues such as this. So um, what I'm saying is that I don't think we, it's an opportunity, I think, to really reflect on uh, what is unique about what we do in our cultural context. Uh, do we need to continually um, ape uh, the capitalist system that is often, um, you know, built on hierarchies of uh, those who have and those who don't, uh, the promise of trickle down things which never happen, you know, uh, all of this kind of thing needs to be interrogated. And um, I sort of went through some of that stuff with the Trumponomics sort of agenda. But, you know, uh, I think it should cause our iwi leadership uh, uh, to think more carefully about that. Yep, we need income. Yep, we need to, uh, you know, uh, but how do we uh, more, uh, I think, intentionally nurture the well-being of our communities across several indices? Yes. I agree. I mean, I was interested in the business conversation um, where the Prime Minister was talking about businesses yesterday and around Māori business, and she said one particular area uh, in terms of iwi involvement could be food production, which I found to be an interesting one, because actually I think we would frame that as food sovereignty. Oh. And so how do we feed our people in ways that actually, um, you know, I've always felt, you know, we have the potential uh, to undercut the kind of whole capitalist food production process yeah. and be more about the food sovereignty. And that's something you've written about, um, Linda, when you wrote that uh, iwi paper around food sovereignty. So I think the whole monarchy and caring of our people on multiple layers that you're talking about, Grant, multiple levels, that's really critical. So we're coming near the end of the time for this session. Um, next Monday, we are joined with Margie Marker our kahununu whananga from uh, UH Manoa, and she's going to pose questions to all of us um, and uh, really have an open, more of a kind of armchair conversation with her, which will be uh, something that um, you know, I'm looking forward to. I want to close this session kind of just keeping with that theme of well-being of our people, Linda, with um, the very first new project that you're advocating in the third version, Oh, yeah. For love. Yeah. Maybe you could close us on what that project is about and what your intention is in terms of speaking to that as an Indigenous project, and then we'll hand over to Wheaton. Yeah, so, so I've got a new chapter uh, in the third edition, uh, which is 20 new projects, which... Um, I've been thinking about for the last um, three or four years uh, in terms of how to frame these projects and using the same 
approach that I did for the first set of projects. But my number one um, nominated project in this chapter is the project of loving, of love, and coming from a place of love. And I think as a researcher and a scholar, it's really a, a kind of fundamental place, I think, which we should all come from. And, you know, why does that matter? Because if you look at a lot of research about Indigenous peoples, they're all trying to save us. You know, it's coming from this desire to save Indigenous peoples from ourselves, generally. Uh, whereas in thinking more deeply about it, I think our responsibility is, is not to try and save our people from themselves, but to love Firstly, love our people, and in a, in a deep way, love the colour of our skin and the shape of our noses, um, our bodies, our being, our humour, and to have that drive the motivations for our research. But also, um, you know, there's a lot of literature now about what's called decolonial love, about being more inclusive of different genders, um, you know, thinking and crossing the boundaries of just like strict indigenous identities, being good allies, all sorts of things. But I think even prior to all those ideas is firstly, we as researchers have to kind of love, love our people. It, it, it might seem like stating that the obvious, but actually, I don't think it drives some indigenous researchers. I think it's implicit that we think we're doing this um, from a place of love. And I'm not saying that as a mushy emotion. I th I'm thinking about love in a political way, social way, cultural way, um, and kind of understand we have different concepts for what love might mean in our own languages. And with that comes different responsibilities uh, for, for what that puts on us. So that, that's one of my new projects. Mm. All right, kia ora. Wow, isn't that fitting? My t-shirt says, love who you are. That's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. So, yeah, that, that finished it perfectly, actually. And um, once again, I do know I speak on behalf of the many thousands of people that um, watch these um, these casts um, and these kōrero um, when I say, nā mā tau hoki te whiwhi, nā mā tau hoki te hōnore, nā mā tau hoki te maringa nui. So, um, Thank you once again uh, very, very much for your time, um, your valuable time, and I definitely do look forward to next week. Um, yeah, um, to, it is, it, it's exciting, and to um, see you grilled by uh, Marky Marker would be absolutely fantastic. No, not grilled, but I mean, you know, opening uh -huh. up it all, um, even, even further. Um, and it is a pity that um, our next session will be our last one in this series only. So, yeah, we'll look at um, other kaupapa. Um, keep moving forward because I know we're having a lot of feedback. And, oh, please don't stop. Please carry on. So, I mean, kaya koutou te tsikanga. So, on that note, um, let's close our session up. Uh, Kia ta fai mai te ariki kia mātau i tēnei rā kua tatari nei hoki mātau ki a koe. Ko koe tonu hei ringa ringa arahi mō mātau i tēnei rā tēnei rā te whaka ora nō koe a mātau i ngā wā te raru koe a mātau ka whaka moe me tika whaka kroori a ki tō i ngā tapu. Āmene. Thank you. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora.